You know that sinking lump in your throat that often accompanies a rush of blood and warmth to your face as your heart begins to pound and you start to sweat and you begin to breathe faster and faster and you're panicking and you're asking yourself why would I ever think it would be a good idea to do that or how did I ever think it would be a good idea to say that or why was I just in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing? Humiliation, whether past, present, or future, absolutely sucks. And often, the fear of being embarrassed is what prevents people from taking personal risks that could otherwise drive them towards immense personal growth or help them achieve numerous goals. But don't just take this from anybody. I consider myself a professional risk taker at this point. I've done many impulsive things that I may or may not be proud of. Many things that have often led to very embarrassing moments, often in public as well, such as getting rejected by boys I ask out at school in front of the entire student body. Very exciting things. But that's how I've learned to overcome the fear of embarrassment when taking risks. And lucky for you, the best way to overcome embarrassment is really nothing more than a simple skincare routine for thick skin. And that skincare routine consists of three handy sayings. Our first saying will be our deep cleanser, what helps you eliminate the root of the issue that's causing you embarrassment, what acts like a deep cleanser would, el eliminating the first layer of dust and debris. Our second saying is the toner. It's what helps the moisturizer later better set in. It's what helps you clean out excess debris that the deep cleanser might have missed. And our third saying is the moisturizer. It's what keeps your thick skin firm, smooth, and able to withstand embarrassment in the future. So without further ado, I'm here to share with you this super magical skincare routine. Now, the first saying was actually something that came to me when I was in the middle of a grade nine school orchestra concert. As a percussionist, I was in the back playing the timpani or the kettle drums for very large drums that are positioned like this. And we wham them with loud mallets and make loud noises that should hopefully harmonize with the notes that the rest of the orchestra is playing. So we were playing a Mozart sonata and I was whamming along when suddenly I realized that one of the timpani drums had gone slightly out of pitch. And as soon as I banged it with all of my might, a wrong note ringed out and it stuck out so much like a sore thumb that at that point I was sure my reputation would be ruined. And because I began to panic on stage, I was thinking, wow, that sounded really, really not like the rest of the Mozart sonata, like Mozart was suddenly a 20th century composer doing something completely impressionistic. I tried my best to calm down, but it wasn't working. Soon, I was losing my place. As the rest of the orchestra continued with violins playing at a completely different measure that I was not aware of, I was flipping through my sheet music, trying to find exactly where the orchestra was. But in my moment of, moment of panic, I remembered something that our conductor had told us right before we came up stage. And that was, if you make a mistake on stage, the best thing to do is probably to ignore it. The best thing to do is to act confident, like that wrong note was actually part of your master plan all along, like that wrong note is actually what Mozart originally intended the sonata to be performed like. So that's what I tried to do. As the orchestra and everybody else was playing the right note, I sat at the back with my mallets trying to look confident and smiling at the audience. And at the very end of the piece, I slammed down on the right notes, slightly later than everybody else for the final notes, but on time. And people decided to buy it. And that is our first saying, ladies and gentlemen, the deep cleanser that eliminates the root cause of the problem that leads to your embarrassment. And that saying is, you can fix it. That's what our conductor told us when we were on stage. And what he said did make sense. We could fix it on stage by trying to ignore the issue. And that advice worked really, really well for me, not just for that one performance, but for other things as well. For example, if I raised my hand in math class and yelled out a complete wrong answer, I would tell myself, hey, you can fix this. It's just, you know, a math class and you happen to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. And I would just go home and study harder or write the right answer on the board. If I was asking out a guy I really liked and he rejected me on the spot, it was, you can fix it. You can just say, oh, well, <laughs> that was actually a joke, so you fell for it, but funny, funny you. And that or, that was a dare my friend told me to do. Very popular options. Generally, you can fix it, but sometimes you can't. And I realized that issue 7 p.m. one day at a Granville Island theater, super similar to this one. It was the year-end performance for everybody at our speech and drama studio and we filed out of our cars in fancy clothing, 
myself in super expensive dress pants and a very nice blazer. And we went backstage to do some backstage warm-ups. Now, one of the first warm-up games we played was intended to help us get to know other performers better. So, we would toss each other a red rubber dodgeball, and when somebody caught the ball, they would say their name and they would do a dance move. So as we were throwing the balls around the circle, some people caught the balls, they said their name, and they did something a bit more sensible, maybe like the arm snake or the body snake even. But I decided to be different. I wanted to stand out. Now this was in grade eight, mind you, so quirky wasn't exactly a bad thing yet. But I wanted to be that, I wanted to be different. I wanted to be cool. So when I got the ball, I said, hey guys, my name is Grace. I put down the ball and I did the Russian Kazatsky kick. Now I'm not gonna do it now here in front of you because I've learned my lesson. But that dance consists of squatting down and kicking your legs up like that in a can-can-like motion repeatedly. And I'll give you a hint. Those dress pants were pretty tight and they were really, really well stitched, but tightly stitched. So as soon as I got down, crouched, and began to kick, I realized that it was a really, really bad idea. First, there was a rip so loud that it silenced all the small talk in the entire room, and I realized that rip had come from the bottom of my pants. Second of all, I realized that, hey, these pants suddenly got so surprisingly spacious, but wait, that's probably no coincidence because of that loud rip. And immediately, I got back up and went back to the edge of the circle and tried to pretend that nobody was looking at me weirdly and that nothing had ever happened. But... I realized that that probably was not true because at that point, everybody has started looking at me, started whispering about me. So as soon as this warm-up game was over, I ran out the door and into the hallway, trying to keep my butt to the wall so nobody could see that big rip in my pants. And as I slunk down the hallway, trying to ignore people's confused glances if they walked by, one of the teachers came, and it was one of the stricter ones too. He was one of the most respected teachers in the speech and drama faculty, Mr. Chen. He looked super, super strict as well. I've never talked to him before, not before this incident. So I only knew him as that one teacher with the rigid square framed glasses and the slick back black hair and who never seemed to smile. So when he approached me, I immediately froze. And he said, hey, Grace, I heard that rip. And I said, oh, you did? Oh, well. Um, I don't think it was me, <laughs> it might have been something else, it might have gotten me mixed up. And he said, you know, it's okay if you need any help. You can't ask for help, you know. And he reaches to his back pocket and pulls out a roll of black tape, my saving grace at the moment. And that is our second saying, you can ask for help. Because chances are a lot of the times you won't have the solutions to the problems you cause. We are humans, that's natural. We don't have answers to everything. And right then, I didn't have a needle and a spool of black thread in my hands ready to give me so that I could sew my pants back together. So I really, really needed that help. So I accepted his offer of help. But then I looked at the tape and I was like, this tape is a bit more of an ashen gray. It's kind of a different shade of black than the black on my pants. And I happen to have to turn around in my performance so that my butt is facing the audience. And I don't want the audience to notice that the shades are really obviously off. So can I, can I just go home, please? And then he tells me, well, I've seen you at the dress rehearsals before this performance and you were phenomenal. Why would you want to let all of that work go to waste? just because some people might notice that the colors, the shades on your pants are a bit different. But I said, well, you see, I don't really want the audience to look at me and immediately laugh and not pay attention to any of the hard work I put into the actual Macbeth scene I'm doing. And that's when he said, you know, the audience, they've probably been there before. They're all people. They've probably had embarrassing things happen to them. And I said, you know what? It sounds like you're just trying to use a bunch of different rhetorical methods to coerce me into performing anyway. So to make you happy, fine, yeah. I'll, I'll perform with this very obviously not right color shade of black on my pants. So I go to the washroom and I fix up my pants and I come back on stage. And I'm running over what he said to me. I asked for help. That was cool. I was able to not think about the big issue I was dealing with, the literal big issue at the bottom of my pants. But as soon as I went on stage and I began to perform Macbeth, I completely forgot what he said about the audience being nicer than they look. So when I turn around to pick up my dagger prop that I needed to perform, my worst fears were confirmed. 
Immediately, the room went from slightly silent with a couple sporadic coughs and the shuffling of jackets to so, so loud to my ears, accustomed to that silence. People began to whisper. Even though my back was turned, I could feel them point, I could feel them stare, I could feel them talk about that girl up there with the very obviously mismatched color on her pants, and I began to panic. I grabbed the dagger, and I froze, and in a millisecond, my brain ran through all the possible scenarios that could happen to me if I continued on with the scene. But because I thought that running off stage in the middle of my performance might be a little, little bit more embarrassing than just staying and seeing it through, I decided to keep performing and just to take a chance and believe what Mr. Chen said, that the audience might actually be nicer than they seem. And lucky for me, they were. As soon as I turned back around to face the audience, right forward there, they stopped laughing. There definitely wasn't as much whispering and all the stares were almost shamefully redirected to other spots on the stage, as well as myself, obviously. But that performance continued on without as much as a hitch. And I'm glad I stayed for that performance because I ended up winning one of the gold medal certificates for it. So clearly, it was the right choice to make. But in that moment, it definitely did not feel like that at all. And I definitely would not have predicted that my performance was good enough to win a gold medal. And that's because of the fundamental nature of embarrassment. Embarrassment impairs your long-term thinking. It keeps you focused only on the way your heart pounds, only on the way you know people are gonna watch as your face grows even redder. It keeps you focused only on you in the moment, getting perhaps laughed at, even if it's quietly, by the people around you. So that's when I went home that night with my gold certificate in my hand, and I remembered what else Mr. Chen had told me right after he told me that the audience is nicer than they seem. And he had said that I'll probably laugh at this one day. And that's our third saying. You'll laugh at this one day. Worst comes to worst, right? And nothing else works. Hey, it'll be funny one day. You'll be able to use it for something else other than just to keep yourself up at 3 a.m. sleepless because you're thinking about that one thing you did four years ago. That's exactly what I'm doing right now as I milk that embarrassing thing that happened to me for this very speech. If you remember that what you did that was embarrassing will be funny one day, that will not only help you overcome the embarrassment in the future, it'll help you in the moment. So let's say people are laughing at you because you did do something really embarrassing and although you fixed it, it might have been too late already. Well, what's the worst thing that could happen? Try to laugh with them, maybe even bandwagon on some of the jokes that they're making about you. This is one aspect I like a lot about embarrassment as well, that's a strange thing to say, but it often reveals more sides of yourself that people wouldn't otherwise be able to see. It shows how you're comfortable with being vulnerable around people, how you're comfortable with taking risks, how you're resilient and able to adapt when bad things happen to you. It shows your sense of humor if you decide to go along with those jokes. It shows your ability to self-deprecate. People will probably be really, really impressed with you if you're able to know that you did something embarrassing, know that you're embarrassed in the moment, and still soldier on through it. Which is why this third saying, that you'll laugh at it one day, is our moisturizer for our skincare routine. Because it not only makes your skin much more damp and soft in the moment, It'll keep it firm and smooth in the long run, so you'll be able to take whatever embarrassment throws at you. Now, you may be wondering whether or not these tricks really work. Well, I say, look at me. I don't really have any scientific studies to bring up to you or academic journals published about the success rate of knowing these three sayings, but I can tell you that after experiencing countless moments of embarrassment, I'm still up here today giving this speech to you. I'm still able to fi face this wide audience and possibly more people watching online despite the fact that I've been through moments of embarrassment in public and on stage. So in the future, when you're thinking about whether or not you should take this risk, but you're afraid to because you don't want to be humiliated, I want you to just remember the skincare routine. Number one our deep cleanser, you can probably, probably fix it. Eliminate the root cause of the embarrassment, eliminate the problem. And number two, 
Even if you can't fix it, you have the aid of the toner of the skincare routine. You can ask other people for help. It's okay to ask for help, and it's not embarrassing at all. Especially because asking for help after that embarrassing moment probably isn't as embarrassing as the original embarrassing moment. But number three, worst case scenario, in the long run, you'll laugh at this one day. And that's going to be the moisturizer. So don't be shackled by that petty thing we call embarrassment or the fear of humiliation. Instead, go out and take those risks.